Hi, thanks for joining us for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. I'm Chris Cooper. Peppers at the store are so expensive, but they are easy to grow in your garden. Today we are planting some. Also, tree borers can be devastating, and they are hard to detect until it's too late. That's just ahead on the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Production funding for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South is provided by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to the Family Plot. I'm Chris Cooper. Joining me today is Dr. Natalie Baumgartner. Dr. Natalie is the Residential and Consumer Horticulture Extension Specialist for UT Extension, and Dr. Frank Hale will be joining me later. Hi, right, Doc. We're at the Square Foot Garden. Uh, I know. It's the Family Plot Square Foot Garden. I know. Exciting. So what do you Great think? for small spaces. It looks awesome. We've got some cool season, uh -huh. early warm season. Okay. I will admit that I have eaten a few of okay. these already. It yeah. pretty good? <laughs> They're pretty good. Pretty good? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, look, we're glad you're here. And we want to plant peppers. It is that time. So oh, yeah. tell us a little bit about the peppers that you brought for us today. Yeah, so I actually brought you a selection of some of the peppers that I'm growing in my research plots in Knoxville. Good deal. So Good you're going to have kind of a mini trial system here. And I actually brought some grafted and some ungrafted peppers. Okay. And we're going to put in a tiny research plot. So we're going to have kind okay. of a control and a treatment going so here. So can we tell the people what you mean by grafted and ungrafted? Yeah, okay. absolutely. So um, these are actually peppers that have a different scion and rootstock, right? So the leaves come from a different plant than okay. the roots did. Gotcha. And uh, you can actually look a little bit close here and see where they were uh, cut together. I see that see little it. angle? I yeah, so it. that is the okay. graft union. And it. the purpose of this is to improve both potentially disease resistance as well as productivity. Oh, we like productivity. Yeah. Don't we? Okay. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so I have done grafted tomato research actually for several years, okay. going back even to grad school. And this is the second year that I'll be working with grafted peppers. Okay. Got it. And so when we think about these crops, um, say maybe we prefer heirlooms okay. or, you know, some of our favorite open pollinated types of cultivars that don't have some of the soil borne disease resistance that the newer cultivars okay. have. Well, gotcha. this allows us to get the best of both worlds. I like that. Yeah. Okay. Or possibly we have, you know, a good site, not really a lot of disease challenges, but we just want to up the vigor. And what this allows us to do is have a vigorous root system that can even increase the plant size, potentially increase the productivity. Like and so those are the things that we'll be looking at. Plant, I get, I uh, get. you know, fruit number, fruit size. Okay. Yeah, I like that. That sounds good. Yeah. So, um, so of course, you know, to do the to do the comparison, we have Big Bertha, ungrafted <laughs> and grafted. So Big Bertha. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, and I bet I bet we've got several folks that grow. I bet you we do. Big Bertha. It is one of our favorite. It's an elongated bell, so most of the time I harvest it green, but you know it'll ripen all the way to red okay. if you can leave it out there long enough and keep it healthy. <laughs> so this has been one of our favorite performers over the last few years in several of our of our home garden trials in, in Knoxville. Now we're now we're trying them grafted. We will see how they perform here in our yeah. square foot garden. Yeah. How about that? Yeah. All right. So you want to demonstrate to us how you're gonna plant? Big yeah. Bertha? Yeah, absolutely. So I think maybe we will start with the ungrafted because okay. there's going to be just a little nuance with the grafted plant that we'll talk about. Good. So now I only have one tag here, which is not a perfect demonstration, but oh. we'll imagine that we have mo <laughs> enough right. tags so that we can always uh, leave one right. with our plant so we can see we have pretty good root coverage yeah, nice, nice. throughout the root ball, but not a lot of, um, you know, it's not root bound. Okay. So, you know, I consider this a pretty good size and just so just so you know and of course our uh, viewers these have been out in our shade house for the past oh, nice. week couple of weeks okay. and so they've been hardened off I didn't ready to go yeah okay. I didn't just pull gotcha. them out gotcha. from the warm and happy uh, greenhouse so, so why do we need to harden them anyway just in case somebody has that question right yeah yeah, yeah great well yeah sometimes we all throw around yeah. terms, yeah. don't yeah. we yeah so with the hardening off what we really want to do is acclimate the plant to the yeah outdoor conditions. So okay. when they're growing in a greenhouse, especially in kind of our humid mid-south mm -hmm. environments, they have had a high humidity, they've had lower light, and so they've been babied, right? It's okay. been perfect for ideal and rapid growth. But we want to kind of 
uh, toughen them up a yeah. bit. And so we get them used to higher light levels. We get them used to air movement, right? All it's right. been windy in the past right. few weeks. Yeah, and so, windy, that's for sure. you know, they have gotten used to more air movement because, of course, when we, when we have them inside with very low air movement, they don't have as thick a cuticle. Mm -hmm. They're not going to lose water as much. Okay. And so transitioning them will, you know, will help them reduce the stress once they get in the ground. Good deal. Good deal. So here in your square foot garden, yes. this is a very simple <laughs> planting system. I didn't need to bring my measuring tape okay. or anything no, 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 because no, no, no. one plant in one square. So when I plant these, I want to put them so that my, um, I'm just real similar to the depth that I was in the pot. Got it. Um, and okay. you've got, oh, this is, you know, this Do you is like great. This oh, this is like very it? easy to work with. Yeah, yeah really, Good. really uh, friable and uh, what? Good tilth. That's Good what tilth. we say, right? That's the Good word. Tilth. tilth. Um, so I want to keep it pretty close to the level that it was in its growing container, but I'm going to make sure that I cover up that media just a little bit because that peat moss will dry out uh, okay. rapidly. So I'm not going to push down hard, but I'm going to kind of tamp that down firm it in there, make sure I get good soil contact with those young roots. And then, of course, we'll we'll come back in and do a little bit of watering to, again, mm -hmm. kind of settle that soil around those roots and, and get it started off. And if we have a little bit of soluble fertilizer, we might give them mm. just a little bit. So just a little bit. A okay. little bit of a shot okay. as well. Okay. Um, so do we need to be concerned about those lower leaves? Is it well, okay? So, I mean, these are, these are actually the cotyledons okay. and these are the uh, first first true leaves right. and um for the most part we'll just we'll just plant them okay. and uh and let them go we're all good. still you know we're pretty healthy we don't really have any any serious yellowing okay. or, or anything going on we'll actually find that on some of these grafted plants uh we have actually the cotyledons have already come off and some oh, of these okay. uh lower leaves we may just go ahead gotcha. and gotcha. remove you can see we've yeah, even got a yeah secondary shoot uh coming okay. through there so beside our ungrafted plant we are going to put in a grafted plant. I'm going to pull this little stake out. <laughs> this was actually what secured that graft. It is a tiny little silicon clip and then as the plant heals it just pops off. How about that? So you know we don't need it. I just kind of keep it as my shorthand. I always know what my grafted and ungrafted okay. plants are because we have the, uh, the small neat. silicon clip. So the key to planting is to make sure that we do not bury the graft union. Don't bear the because grass. we might get then roots coming from our scion, which would not have maybe that soil-borne disease resistance ah, or that it. vigor. And this okay. is similar to tomatoes. It's similar to the way we plant a grafted apple tree, okay. right? We want to make sure that we always have that um, graft union up above. So we can Got clearly it. see our graft union. And, you know, in an ideal world, we'd have, you know, <laughs> an inch and a half or a couple, three <laughs> inches. We will do what we can okay. in this um, <laughs> in this instance and uh, so i'm going to put them once again right here in the middle and uh and then we can you know we can easily see oh yeah we're just gonna barely cover up that top just barely yeah all right yeah okay. all right and uh and of course we'll we'll come back in, in a little bit and put some support okay on those but you know their their stems they're not completely straight. They got blown a little bit while they were hardening off, but but they're pretty they're pretty stocky. Okay. And so they'll they look good. Yeah, they'll hold up pretty well. So for our third pepper, we'll go ahead and stick him in the ground, and uh, he is once again going to go right in the middle of our square foot, right okay. here. All right. We're watching that technique there. Okay. All right. Just covering up Just our covered up. Okay. peat moss there, and there is our miniature pepper trial, ready miniature to rock and roll. Pepper trial. How about that? That's pretty cool. We get to have our own trial right here in the yeah. family plot square foot garden. Yeah, this is citizen science right here. Citizen science yeah. at its best. Yeah, absolutely. Dr. Nelly, thank you so much. We appreciate that. Yeah, yeah. This is this is cool. I actually have some other community gardens and spots around the state okay. that are growing some of these trials. So it'll be fun. You are the furthest west location, so you're, you're our warmest site. Yeah. All right. So good for us. So people are yeah. going to be checking us for that data. Absolutely. All right. Yep. Good deal. Thank you much. Yep.
Our strawberries are not growing in the most ideal conditions here. Last year when I renovated it uh, in the fall, I put down white plastic and I planted into the white plastic for the strawberries, except over the winter, the sun totally degraded the white plastic and it all blew away. So that wasn't good, first of all. But as you can see now, we've got a lot of weeds and we're getting problems with our strawberries. So here is an example. We're getting this um, rotting going on. We also have some strawberries that are being eaten by slugs. A lot of this can be attributed to the fact that it's not growing on plastic. We have a lot of berries. Unfortunately, about half of them we can't eat. Hi, Doc. How are you doing, Chris? How are you doing today? Well, I'm pretty happy. I brought all my wood boring yeah, insect all display. Yeah. All right. So yeah. let's talk a little bit about those tree borers. Yeah. Uh, why are wood boring insects important? They can actually cause the de decline of a tree or even the death of a tree. Okay. They're tunneling into the wood. They might be feeding underneath the bark and they're actually injuring the, the tree. And often you think of them as nature's way to decompose a tree while it's still standing. Okay. They usually okay. go after weakened trees or declining trees, but there's some pests we have will go after trees that look apparently pretty healthy. Okay. So what happens when you see a hole in a branch or in a trunk of the tree. Can you see these holes here? This is a camphor shot borer. It's an ambrosia beetle from, uh, from Asia. Mm. It came over here. And when you see holes in the tree, that means that beetle's been in there probably a year wow, or even cool. longer. Okay. That means those are the exit holes. Okay. So that indicates, now a lot of people get uh, yellow-bellied sapsucker and other yeah. woodpeckers uh, holes uh, confused, but these are more random where the uh, yellow-bellied sapsucker more encircles the trunk of the tree. Right. Okay. But ambrosia beetles, when they, when they tunnel in, just think of somebody with a drill. They drill straight in the tree and then make a right or left turn. So <laughs> I split these twigs, and once inside the plant, then they inoculate it with a fungi. And the white amb ambrosial fungi is what the larvae feed on. Oh, okay. So they make their own little mushroom garden inside your tree. Right. And that can be, be a big problem. Often in late winter, early spring, we'll see the granulate ambrosia beetle. And as you can see here, the beetle will have these little toothpick-like frass mm -hmm. tubes. As they tunnel in, they eject out the, the sawdust-like frass. And okay. you'll see these little things, maybe an inch long or so. And if you touch them, they just disintegrate. Right. So to protect against these, you have to put a protective insecticide spray on the uh, the bark of the tree. So now, when would you when would you do that? Well, for ambrosia beetle like the granulate ambrosia beetle, we do that when it when we get those first 70 degree temperature days in late winter early spring. Okay. The beetles start flying then and become active. And we actually put out traps baited with ethyl alcohol. Mm. They go right to it because a stressed tree releases uh. ethyl alcohol and they'll go to the trap. And so we all usually tell our county agents when the, the beetles are flying so they can get the word out. Okay. Yeah. Every year we also see clear wing borers. Mm -hmm. Now this, you can see these round holes, clear wing size. borers. Mm -hmm. And here is actually the, the uh, lilac borer you can see it, or a banded ash clear wing. I think it's lilac borer. It also attacks ash trees, lilac and ash. This is a native clear wing borer, so it's actually a moth. It flies around during the day. It's a day flying moth, and uh, it'll lay its egg. Other uh, clear wing borers would be the dogwood borer, yeah. the peach tree borer. Let me show you some, the, what these moths actually look like. Yeah, that's so neat. They're called clear wings because they don't have all the wing covered with scale. Okay. And so they mimic bees and wasps and a little, they flit around in the sunshine like you would see a bee. Mm. And so predators kind of leave them alone. They're not going to mess with a bee. They don't want to get attacked, so to speak. <laughs> Sometimes uh, we don't think of uh, the peach tree borer will attack plants in the genus Prunus, which includes cherry laurel mm -hmm. or Otoleucan laurel. So this is the trunk of one, and you can see wow. that it has totally been, if I turn it around here, here's the actual moth, lays its egg on the trunk, the caterpillar then feeds underneath the bark, and you can see here all the yeah. bark has been, has got off the, you know, fallen off. So this girdles the plant and kills it. Okay. The, the water can't go up and down the tree. So that's, uh, that, that actually killed the plant. We have some other uh, uh, beetles, they're called 
Let me move this out of the way. These are called metallic wood boring beetles, yeah, and the larvae are called flat-headed borers. And the, so the larvae gets underneath the bark again, and as you can see here on this, this uh, tree trunk, it kind of makes a spiral as it goes and feeds underneath. Mm -hmm. Kills that cambial tissue. So the beetles come out, they often lay their eggs on the sunny part of the side of the tree, south or southwest side in the spring, and then the caterpillars are underneath. And they're gonna be underneath the tree for a year or so. Wow. And then they'll come out the next year usually. Sometimes you'll, the, we have a new pest, it's a, uh, called the emerald ash oh, borer. Right. It's from China. Yeah. And it got over here in 2010, we found it in Knoxville area. It now it's in Middle Tennessee, uh -oh. and it's heading this it's way. Heading this I don't way. know if it's, yeah. I don't think it's been found here yet okay. in West Tennessee. But you can see here, this is the, the wood of the tree underneath the bark, and it look, you see these meandering tunnels. That's where the flat-headed boar larvae, it's kind of flattened, and it can live there, and it feeds, feeds on the uh, uh, cambial tissue. Mm -hmm. So that's the water conducting tissue, the growth ring uh, tissue that uh, allows the plant to grow. So this will, within a few years, kill the tree also. Wow. So we're really going to lose probably most all of our ash trees, native ash trees in North America. Uh, this, the little pink shows here where, where there's a D-shaped exit hole. I just painted it pink so it'd show up better. Okay. It's kind of hard to see on the bark. So we did that to accent it. But that means that that beetle had been in there a year and it emerged in the spring. Mm -hmm. So we generally use systemic insecticides. To, if there's a tree, like an ash tree, that you want to preserve in your front yard and side yard, a real nice tree, you can uh, treat it with uh, uh, tree injection products like triage or we can mm -hmm. uh, drench around the roots okay. with systemic, systemic. insecticides. Uh, so can you, you can, can you kill use those as a preventative, though. Well, we I would. We don't recommend uh, using the insecticides. They're a little expensive okay. until you actually have these cited in your county. Okay. Once they're in your county, you can start protecting it. Okay. So I wouldn't do anything right now. There's no need to. Right. But if you notice trees in general with wood boring insects, they're going to start see some branch die back mm -hmm. in the top of the tree first. You'll see a thinner canopy, fewer leaves. Mm -hmm. You might even, with the emerald ash borer, you might even see uh, uh, epicormic sprouts that are at the base of the oh, tree. Okay. So it's putting up all these little sprouts because the top of the tree is just starting to die. Okay. So you really want to treat this though early before there's much damage if you want to preserve the tree. Okay. Gotcha. I just wanted to show you here is uh, we made a nice little display mm -hmm. showing the emerald ash borer. The beetle is right here, the beetles. They're not very big at all. No, they're not. Um, but they're, metal they're metallic green, emerald color. The larvae are what do most of the damage. And they're elongated, might be an inch or so long, uh, kind of cream colored. So this is really ecological disaster. It's gonna kill most wow. of the ash trees in North America. And that, uh, it got over here. Once it got here, we couldn't do much about it because it already started to spread. People actually cut down trees, move firewood. So that's why it's important not to bring firewood yeah. into our state parks from up. elsewhere. Right. Uh, a, a pest we don't have in Tennessee and we don't want is the <laughs> Asian longhorn beetle. It's okay. one of the round-headed borers. This is also, you can see it has the real long antennae. That's mm -hmm. why it's called longhorn beetles. We have native longhorn beetles, but this one likes to attack maple trees mm. and buckeye trees okay. and horse chestnut. So we have lo you know millions of, of, of uh, maple trees. We don't need a wood boring pest. No. The, the closest infestation is Claremont County, Ohio, east of Cincinnati, Ohio, but north of the Ohio River. Okay. They're trying to eradicate that right now and doing a pretty good job. So whenever this is found, we actually go in and try to eradicate it because it could do a lot of damage. Wow, that's some good stuff. Yeah, there's, there's just uh, lots, and, and we really tell people that, uh, when it comes to wood boring insects, you have to ha have some preventative sprays. When you plant a new tree and you put it in the ground, you want to drench it with an insecticide for, for pests like round-headed borers, flat-headed borers, uh, those beetle uh, borers, that okay. will protect them. Other uh, type borers, like clear wing borers, you'll have to put a trunk spray. But we have all that information at UT Extension Publications. Sure. 
uh, we can check out uh, PB1589. Okay. It has a lot of information. Look at this, you already know the number. That's pretty good. Thank you, Doc. That was good information. Thank you, Chris. Good stuff. Good stuff. So our cauliflower is coming along really good, but if you notice, we have something eating it. And I actually have seen it. It is a imported cabbage worm. And imported cabbage worms uh, can be very hard to find, uh, especially if they're down inside the plant. Uh, one of the easiest ways to take care of them, and also an organic way, is to use Bacillus thuringiensis, or Bt. The caterpillar will eat the Bt, it will give them a stomach ache, they'll stop feeding almost immediately, and a few days later they'll die. Um, and so we're going to spray Bt here on the cauliflower. You don't need to soak it, but you just need to spray all the leaves. And I got some on my finger, but because it's BT, it's not that big of a deal. I'll just make sure that I wash my hands when I'm done. And make sure the, they, the cabbage worms like to feed on the tender new growth in the middle, so just make sure that I got that covered as well. So there we go. This is now protected, at least until it rains, from the imported cabbage worm. All right, Doc, here's our Q&A segment. You ready? Yeah, These are go. some great questions, know, right? good mixture, yeah. All right, so here's our first viewer email. Will orange rocket barberry grow with mm -hmm. only morning sun? And this is Alice on YouTube. I thought that was pretty interesting. With only morning sun. And, and I know a little bit about the orange rocket barberry, right? So zones, what, four to five to nine? Yeah, right? I mean, we're talking about pretty versatile. Pretty versatile, yeah. beautiful plant. But only morning sun? What do you think? Yeah, I mean, like, barberry is nice in the sense that it can be full, <laughs> it can be partial. Yeah. But, I mean, even when we think partial, we say four to six. Like, I, I'm, I'd be concerned that we might not get as high-quality coloration. See, that's what I'm thinking. Was that where you were going to go? That's where I'm going, yeah. If yeah. you want those vibrant colors, full sun. Yeah. Full sun, okay? If not, you're going to have a lot of green. Yeah. Foliage. It's going to survive. Yeah, it's gonna thrive. Right, right, issue, right, you right, know? right, right, right. But yeah, if you want those colors to pop, then I'm thinking full sun. Yeah. All right. So there you have it, Alice. Yeah, full sun for those vibrant colors. Thank you for that question. Here's the next viewer email. This is interesting. I saw your video about cherry gamosis. Two months ago, I planted a one-year-old royal crimson cherry tree. Today, I noticed two spots on the lower trunk of my young cherry that looks like yellow sap that is dry. It is right at the base of the tree. What can I do? Could this be what you're talking about? Thank you. And this Estomed on YouTube. So yeah. do you know a little bit about gamosis? Yeah, tree health. Isn't this one of the tree most health. challenging, you know, because there could be so many. You think about environmental, so you think about insects, you think about disease. Think about disease. I think about mechanical injury. I think yeah. about drought. I think about cold spells that we've, you know, had, right. of course, earlier yeah. this year. Uh, so a lot of things come to mind, but yeah, gamosis, I think about plant stress, of course, yeah. right? And it can be either one of those. But the fact that the spots were toward the Very lower low. trunk yeah. made me think about the cherry tree, peach tree yeah. war. Yeah. In fact, you know, this, uh. this whole, um, whole family, I mean, it's, you know, it's a challenge whether we think production yes. or, yes. or ornamental. In fact, it, you know, it sometimes limits the use of cherries as ornamental trees or reduces their lifespan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they have a lot of issues, but that peach tree bore, <laughs> if there's frass mixed in with the gum, right. I think it could be that bore. And if that's the case, then guess what? There's nothing you could do. Right. It's already in there. It's already done its damage. So at that point, you should try to keep the cherry tree as happy as you possibly can, as comfortable as you How possibly can. Care, I guess we. Yeah, I guess. Say, you know, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, that's all I could uh, you know think yeah. about for that. Investigate the sap a bit more. Yeah, huh? just yeah. a little bit more. Yeah. And if you have any dead, dying limbs or whatever, you might want to prune those out. That yeah. could help. But yeah, at this point, yeah, keep it as comfortable as possible yeah. if you can. So thank you for that question. Mm -hmm. All right. Here's our next viewer email. What are your thoughts on siding with centipede grass on the east side of Chattanooga? What is the best cultivar? I've had centipede where I lived in Clemson, South Carolina, and I loved it. So easy to care for. Thank you. And this is Eric from East Bernard, Tennessee. So I, I like that. He loved it. So centipede grass, of course, is called the lazy man's Low grass, right? Because yep, yep. it grows so slow by stolons, right? 
But as far as sodding in East side of Chattanooga, I think that's possible. Yeah. Well, and we're, we are in the warmest yeah. part of yeah. the East Tennessee. Chattanooga uh -huh. has a little bit of a microclimate that's even much yeah. relatively different from where I live in, you know, in Knoxville. But okay. cold hardy still. So cold hardy, right. Uh, low temperature hardiness, Tiff Blair. Yeah. Okay. That comes to mind. We know a little bit about that, you know, here in the Memphis area. It performs very well, especially in acidic soils, right? So get your soil tested, of course. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, go ahead. Yeah, get Tiff Blair, and I think you should be fine. Because again, low temperature hardiness, frost tolerance, performs pretty well in acidic soils. We have acidic soils here. Yeah. I think you'd be fine. Yeah. I think I you'd mean, be fine. I, I would think, give it a shot. Yeah. Give, give, give it a try. I would give it a shot. I'm, I'm up for anything that reduces a little bit. Of, so. <laughs> right, yeah, because yeah, yeah, low maintenance once you get it you know, yeah. established for the most part. And again, it grows so mm -hmm. slow, so slow. Keep a lot of the foot traffic off of it, you'll be fine. But yeah, he knows a little bit about it anyway. He's yeah. doing it in South Carolina. Yeah, some yeah. experience. That's, so yeah, that's, he that's, has that's had an experience, so that'd be good. So yeah, Tiff Blair, uh, Mr. Eric, that'll help you out tremendously. Thank you yeah. for that question. Hi, right, Nelly. That was fun. Yeah, good to play here. Yeah, this is good. Variety, yeah. All right, thanks so much. Remember, we love to hear from you. Send us an email or letter. The email address is familyplot at wkno.org, and the mailing address is familyplot7151 Cherry Farms Road, Cordova, Tennessee 38016. Or you can go online to familyplotgarden.com. That's all we have time for today. Thanks for watching. The plants are in the ground and the bugs are showing up to the feast. Go to familyplotgarden.com to find out what you can do to keep them at bay. We have videos and links to extension publications about all sorts of garden bugs. Be sure to join us next week for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Be safe.